Okay, so whenever you're ready, you can introduce yourself. Okay, uh, my name is Sanjay Rupralia. I teach in the politics department at the New School for Social Research. Thank you. Um, tell me, can you tell us a little bit why you apply for the fellowship? Sure. Um, well, I've been working on India for over 10 years now, um, and I've worked on various questions about Indian democracy, uh, patterns of development in India, and so on. And uh, for a long time, I've been very fascinated by China. It's an obvious country to compare when you look at India. Uh, I guess another one might be Brazil. Uh, but obviously, uh, each of these countries are quite uh, difficult to understand. I mean, they're very large. They're very uh, old histories. They're very complex in lots of ways. And so uh, it was always a bit forbidding for me to think about how to begin to study China, although it was something that I'd always wanted to do. And I thought uh, the best way uh, to actually approach the subject of China and begin to understand it a little bit was to focus on questions that I'd been studying in the context of India and to see to what extent I could pursue those questions in the case of China through more collaborative work so that I would actually have people who already had an expertise if not being from China uh, that would help me sort of learn more quickly uh, so that was the, that was one sort of very important basic reason I remember you were part of the faculty advisory committee too when this is taking place um, could you say a little bit more about the experience of being part of the faculty advisory committee and seeing the whole the shape of the program unfold? Sure. Um, I mean, I was very, I was very fascinated by, uh, by the whole institute and, you know, its design. Because I, before I came here, I was uh, the assistant director at an institute at Columbia on South Asian Studies. It was called the Southern Asian Institute. And that was a fantastic uh, place. It still is. It's one of the leading centers for South Asia. But like a lot of centers like that in America, Columbia had many of them like that. Um, they were primarily about a region, and people could define the borders of the regions in different ways, but you know, there was a South Asian Institute, there was an East Asian Institute, Latin American Institute, and so on. And when, I, when Ashok invited me to serve on the faculty advisory committee here, I was very uh, intrigued by the Institute because it was trying to cross these two regions. I mean, for instance, when I was at Columbia, the East Asian Institute was a fantastic place and they had a lot of very interesting programming. The Southern Asian Institute, we tried to do the same. But I think in my entire three years there, I think we had one joint event. And so that's what interested me first and foremost about, about EC, uh, was the fact that it was trying to establish a dialogue and institutionalize that dialogue between India and China, which I don't think had been done uh, before, at least to my knowledge. And since then, in the last three years, uh, I've been looking more and more at people who are doing this India-China collaboration. Of course, now there's lots of people who are trying to do it. But I think what's still very unique about uh, EC is the fellows program. I think that's very different. I mean, lots of places now will have events and conferences and seminars where they try to address questions about India and China together. But I don't think any of them today have a fellows program where they bring fellows from India and China uh, to work in collaboration on various research projects. I think that's very unusual as well. And as a new school faculty member and now as a fellow, what do you think is this conversation um, and how it revolves at the new school? And can you s characterize it? a little bit about you know the new school's involvement and, and you in particular maybe as a faculty member and how how this is also bringing in uh, new knowledge or bring, you know bringing out new things um that's actually a harder question to answer uh, but let me think about um i think i think you know how does it affect the new school um we don't have to say that if you don't have no, I mean, I think it's a really interesting question. It's not something mm -hmm. I thought about. Um, I think, I mean, certainly for me, it's, it's an area of research, like I said, I want to explore. And I would like to really deepen my knowledge of China in the future, try to do a genuinely comparative project on India and China, which is very hard to do. 
and so this is a way of learning about you know what would be what would be uh, valuable and possible avenues of research and what would be the pitfalls because one of the things I learned uh, certainly at this recent residency but even speaking to a lot of for instance Chinese fellows who had come over the last three years um, and listening to their talks was that on the one hand India and China are great countries to compare right? in terms of their population in terms of their histories in terms of their size uh, continental size in terms of their internal diversity, although India seems still, but this is because I don't know much about China, it seems to be more diverse in terms of its various social cleavages. But at the same time, there are very stark differences about the countries, obvious differences. Uh, you know, India has been a federal democratic uh, regime since independence, and China took a very different path. So one of the things that's been very interesting for me to learn is about on what issues is a comparison fruitful and on what issues is it actually misleading to try to compare them because uh, and, and the only way you can learn that only way you can know that is to learn about each place in sufficient depth and I was thinking now again about the question that you raised I think what's really interesting about having this project at the new school is of course it has various traditions the new school um, the at the two schools of the new school that I teach at, right, one tradition is, of course, the tradition of John Dewey and Thurston Veblen about uh, research and teaching that um, is oriented towards a public. And I think that's part of the EC mandate. And at the new school for social research, um, there's a very strong tradition of critical social theory, in particular, critical social theories of modernity. Now, here is where I think there's a great opportunity for EC. And being at the new school, hopefully, I still think it's early days about how this plays out, but there's a great opportunity on both sides because it's really about the project of modernity. What does modernity look like in different parts of the world? Uh, and how does it evolve? And for a long time, of course, when people think about non-Western countries, they think about modernity, uh, and there's, of course, been a very extensive you know, scholarly literature on this, they think about it and trying to understand modernity through paradigms that are largely generated by the history of the West. And India and China, like every other post-colonial country or non-Western country, even, even if they've not been colonized, has to engage with this, this era or this project or these challenges of modernity in their own way. And as we've seen, like in India and China, they've taken two very different paths in 1947, 1949. So, I think what is interesting is to try to see what does the history of modernity in India and China tell us about our theories of modernity more largely. That's the conversation that, you know, as I've, as I, as I've just mentioned, I think there are, of course, a number of uh, you know, terrific scholars who have already been doing this, but to, it's, it's, it's still a, an area that a lot of development can take place in. And I think the other way uh, is also to is also to look at the sorry I'm gonna stop I lost my track. Um, you already mentioned too the, you know there are the two tracks the history of modernity and also oriented to the public or in the, something that's oriented to the public and in the theories of modernity yeah. but then you wanted to add more on modernity. Uh, I think that's fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. No, this okay. is all off the top of my head. So. Well, like, well, I mean, having been engaged with some of these issues and thought through, you know, the fellowship, um, what is exactly, you know, can you tell us a little bit about the experience of actually meeting the fellows and actually engaging with them on a day-to-day -day basis on different issues? And, sure. and tell us a little bit about, like, what collaboration looks like, you know, in terms of, like, the, the actual experience of collaboration there's a lot of, it's an aspirational thing, but it's also, what is it like on a, on a very fundamental faith, you know, level, what that, what that has been? Yeah, well, my first impressions when I met a number of the fellows uh, at the beginning of the residency was quite different, and in ways that were probably expected. The Indian fellows, a couple I had already, a couple I already knew. The others I didn't know, 
but India being India, there was about two degrees of separation. So within five minutes of speaking to them, we knew we, we sort of knew 15 people in common. The Chinese fellows, I'd never been to China. I've never done any scholarly work on China. I've been fascinated by China, but I, my personal knowledge in comparison to India is minimal. So I was asking very basic questions. And so we were just trying to get a sense of each other. And I think a really critical turning point in the residency, and I didn't quite know how it would work out, but I'm very glad we did it, was we had a sort of two days where we would, um, where we would introduce ourselves in some depth about you know, who, where, where we came from, where do we grow up, uh, how do we get interested in things we did. And that suddenly transformed the, both the atmosphere and, and of course, the, the interactions we had. Because suddenly there was something quite specific and grounded and rooted about everyone that you could relate to um, in some way. These, you could understand why they were asking the questions they were asking. You got a sense of their likes and dislikes. Um, so that, you know, I think that was, that was really important. And the other thing that really struck me personally during the residency was, and I don't think this was planned, but there was a long continuing conversation about how to interpret the legacies of the Maoist revolution in China, or the successes and failures of democratization, democracy in India. And there were very impassioned disagreements. I mean, they were very respectful, but they were very impassioned. And perhaps predictably, maybe not, you know, it turned out to be that the Indian fellows maybe has something to do with these particular fellows, but they were more likely to defend Mao's legacy than the Chinese were. And so it raised a lot of very interesting issues about how do you evaluate these kinds of historical experiences? Uh, how important is personal experience in evaluating these very large-scale historical changes? And most importantly, you know, how do you structure a dialogue through which there's a sort of enrichment of understanding on both sides of what happened? I mean, it raises a lot of very sort of serious questions about you know, theories of knowledge. How do we know how to evaluate something? Um, and so I thought that was really fascinating. And and I think that exchange is now continuing through, for instance, the correspondence we have through email, which is a collective discussion. So I found that very fascinating because I think, as I said, you know, for me to understand a little bit about China and to hear it from, from, China, from fellows from China, and even amongst themselves there are differences, but to hear different Chinese voices is really important uh, because it sort of illustrates the complexity of these questions. And I think that's what's most important. And so for you, the moment of looking at this as, as a people of exchange have to do with a particular concept of, you know, that different perspectives, of different, bringing different perspectives coming into, say, Mao's revolution. Um, you don't, do you find the disciplinary issues also come into play, or do you actually just find like it's more of an Indian Chinese experience that is, for you draws a sharpest difference? Well, so far, I haven't felt that the disciplinary questions really divide or sort of separate people into different groups in a discussion. That may partly be due to the fact that a lot of the fellows themselves are quite inter or multidisciplinary in their work. They're open to that kind of work, even if they're, you know, very much trained in a in a particular discipline. Um, no, I think it's it's really been about so far about big historical questions. Um, some of the disciplinary issues have come up, actually. Now that you mention it, one of the projects uh, that I have a role in um, is to look at to look at. Um, the ways in which India and China have sought to reform uh, their governmental structures to make them more transparent and open or accountable to their citizens. And this is, a, I think, a really unusual project because at first glance you wouldn't do this kind of project. India is a democratic regime, a very robust democratic regime. China is struggling with questions of democracy. 
And so people would say, why would you compare what is formerly a non-democratic regime with one that clearly is? But as I spoke to some of the Chinese fellows and some of the Indian fellows, we thought it would actually be a very interesting question to ask, to suspend the basic difference in the political regime and say, OK, let's for a moment put those questions aside. They may actually matter a great deal in the final analysis. But let's just ask the question, why would it be the case that even India, which in many cases is the most exceptional democracy in the world, because it shouldn't exist according to any theory. It's not to say that it's perfect or not flawed. Of course it is. But you know, it's something that no one anticipated and no one could really explain very well in the first two decades after independence, uh, certainly the first decade. So why would it be the case that in the 1990s, India, for instance, felt compelled to implement all kinds of reforms that made, uh, it was pressured to, right? Social movements, largely political parties to a lesser extent, pushing the Indian state to make itself more open and accountable. Why would India feel compelled to do that? And in China's case, a similar thing has happened, as I understand, uh, in the certainly the last five to seven years. And some of these things have common uh, underlying causes, the rising social inequalities within both countries, the sense that the benefits of growth are not equally distributed, and so on. So that's what's sort of in common to them. Of course, they're very different political regimes. So we thought what would be interesting is to look at this question. Now, the disciplinary issue arose when one of the Chinese fellows, Zhu Chiong, who is trained as a lawyer and and is very much on the front lines of legal reform in China, and I was really amazed at the work he does, was not as interested in certain questions that, for instance, myself and another Indian fellow were, uh, Milant Murukur. We were interested in sort of the history of these reforms and the ways in which people sought to justify them, implement them, sort of typical social science questions. Whereas Zhu Chiyong thought those were not as interesting or as important as simply looking at to what extent were they effective? To what extent were citizens able to use these new laws, these new ordinances, these new reforms? They, they vary in type and nature. To what effect to have, have they really been able to use them to open the state mm -hmm. to greater scrutiny? And so we had an interesting, actually a bit of a difficult conversation we resolved it, but you know, for two, three hours, uh, we seem to be talking past each other. And, but I think that that difficulty was productive because it forced us to think about what it was we were doing and what questions we were asking. And, uh, and, and, and in the end, I think we all agree that all, set, all of these sort of three questions that I've mentioned, you know, the origins of the reforms, the actual content of the laws, and then their consequences, their practical consequences. All three were very important. But perhaps the best way to do it was a division of labor, where those of us who seem to be more interested in the origins of the reforms would take on that part of the project. Mm -hmm. And those who were more interested in doing very in-depth uh, case studies of how these laws were actually being implemented or used would take on that aspect. So. Um, so what has the experience so far um, been like for you, as, you know, simply as a faculty member, you know, being an easy fellow and a faculty member? What has happened and what do you foresee happening in terms of changing, say, the way you teach or what you teach? Um, can you say a few words about those? Yeah. Um, well, another project that I'm interested in doing, and one of the things I think some of us are still trying to figure out is where is our, our sort of big commitment in terms of projects, because quite a few of the fellows in this residency uh, got themselves involved in two to three projects. So another project which stems from research I've done in India for a long time is to understand um, how do those who identify themselves as part of the left in India and China. So in India, the traditional Marxist left. In China, of course, it's a harder question to ask. But those who call themselves in India, I mean, those who call themselves in China as belonging, uh, identify themselves as belonging to the new left. You know, what does it mean to be left for them? Uh, how do they conceive of the problem of prosperity and inequality? What are their strategies and tactics for addressing these questions? 
um, this is a project I'd like to pursue. Um, it's part of my own research, but it's again clearly it partly links back up to this big historical debate that we were having about the Maoist legacy because it's actually very much tied to that. It's about how to think about well, how do you think about inequality, and what would the strategies be to address inequality? Um, so as a researcher, that's another area I'd like to pursue. As a faculty member, what I eventually hope to do is is develop a course on Indian China uh, around these questions uh, in the future and, and pursue my own work. But it's more about the collaborative work that I'm interested in. I mean, one proposal that's arisen, uh, and I don't quite know how it will play out, but one of the fellows from China, Jian Yi, filmmaker, was very interested in doing a documentary on uh, on this question of who were the the so-called radical Marxists in India and China today, and in fact, another another important place we thought worth considering was Nepal. Mm. Now that the Maoists have come to power, so he actually proposed something that was incredibly exciting for me because most of my work is fairly humdrum and and, um, and straightforward. You know, I read and write, and here was this filmmaker, and he also was a photojournalist. And he proposed, we're still thinking through about how we might do this and when we would do it. It's a question of timing at this stage. But to do actually a documentary um, of who are the, who is the new left? Uh, who, are the, who are the critical Marxists in India? Uh, and of course in India there's also, he was very surprised to learn that there were Maoists in India. He didn't know. He didn't realize that something like a quarter of all districts in India um, face a Maoist challenge armed uh, guerrillas who are basically taking on the state. So that would be a very exciting project for someone like me because I, I would never imagine doing it otherwise. I don't have the skills, I don't, I don't have the experience, but that would be something very exciting to do. So I don't know if that answers your question, but um, in terms of I hope it, it definitely will influence my teaching, whether it's a, actually a specific course on in India and China or whether I try to integrate China into courses I already teach on development or uh, democracy. Um. Um, was there, there anything else you want to add about, you know, whether it has to do with your aspirations to be, you know, for the next two years or to looking back at the presidency? What are some of the questions? Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that I've reflected on quite a bit since the, since the residency was that it it was very demanding, <laughs> and it was also, though, very stimulating. And I think one of the things that happened was, in fact, we all got quite excited about the various projects we might pursue. And so when you ask, what would I do in the next two years, that's something I actually have to think about very carefully now in the next few weeks, uh, to see which projects do I think are both important and feasible to that where I can make progress you know, with others uh, fairly quickly in terms of a two-year time horizon. And then which projects do I think are very important but would grow out of the residency, I mean out of the fellowship more generally. Uh, eventually I would very much like to do a genuine comparative work between the two countries. Um, and, and I hope that you know, the fellowship, and I, already, I can already see, it's not even hope, I can already see that the fellowship's already letting me envision my future work in ways that I, I wouldn't have you know, even before March. So, so it's already made quite a big impact. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. It's okay? Perfect. Perfect.